to join. Okay, cool. We, yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Developer UG for uh, September um, uh, online event again. Uh, Josh has promised that we're going to get back to, to hybrid soon. So that should be cool um, to see everyone in person or as many as we can. Um, but thank you for joining. I know that there's a lot of things to do in the evening. Um, um, but there's nothing better than when there's ESCOM load shedding. If you're sitting in the dark, you might as well tune into something useful and productive. Uh, so, um, I just want to thank our sponsors today uh, for uh, for making this possible. So we are using, um, we've hijacked uh, Intellect's um, uh, Zoom account. So they're providing a, the virtual venue for us. Um, that allows us to do recordings and all these other kind of things that we don't, wouldn't normally be able to do. Um, and the, the the event will be posted to YouTube as well um, after this, um, probably in a week or so. This was a bit of editing. Um, yeah, so if, if, if someone else wants to see it, you can point them to that as well. Um, and then we also have... Um, developer U UG is sponsored by Tarsus On Demand, which is um, a cloud solutions company, and they sponsor um, things like, uh, especially in, when we do in-person events, pizza, beer, um, prizes, those kind of things. So thanks to Tarsus On Demand, go check them out. And then we've also got prizes from JetBrains. So we've got three licenses to give away this evening from JetBrains for any product you want from them. Um, and um, the way we'll give them away is if you ask if the first three people to ask a question during the Q and A part, will get the, the JetBrains prizes. So a good motivation to think of some questions during the presentation and um, then uh, you will give them away then. Okay, cool. On to our, our guest for this evening is Mark Robastelli. And Mark is from um, Fusion Auth and he does developer relations there. And Fusion Auth, if you haven't heard of it, it's an OAuth provider, um, but they're a little bit different from the from the, the plays you might have become familiar with like Cognito or, or, or Zero. Um, you can host it yourself on your own infrastructure and they are very developer focused. Um, yeah, so if you go to the website, there's a lot of developer tools and examples and getting started guides. Um, so Mark has been working there for a few months and is and he's been learning all things OAuth and he's going to kindly tell us all about OAuth and tokens today during this talk. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining. Oh, thank, thank, thanks for having me. Uh... I think you, you, you stole about the, the first part of my, my introduction to my presentation here, but uh, <laughs> we can do it again. <laughs> go ahead and, and, and get that started. Let me uh, get some stuff set up. Uh, looks like we're okay. Can everyone see my, my, my screen okay? Yeah, looks good. All right. I'm oh, getting a little, okay, let's move that there. All right. So, uh, you know, thanks for coming out. As Bradley mentioned, my name is Mark Robustelli, and we'll be talking about protecting our uh, your APIs with OAuth today. So again, as you mentioned, what's Fusion Auth? We're essentially a, a customer identity and access management platform, or built uh, for devs by devs. Uh, and what we basically do is enable you to offload your user management and those security concerns, so you can focus on your core competencies. Uh, many of our customers are, are currently using Fusion Auth to protect their APIs, and to date, we have uh, over 10 million downloads and, and hundreds of paying customers. So, a, a little bit more about me: I'm uh, been a software develop in, in software development for over 25 years. Uh, recently, started my gig at Fusion Auth here about three months ago, as Bradley mentioned, as a developer relations engineer. It's great; I get to combine my my love of technology with my passion for helping people. And a few fun facts. Well, fun's relative, so at least they're facts. But about uh, a year ago, I, I moved out to Arizona, so enjoying the, the beautiful sunshine and scenery out here. And uh, got a couple of big dogs, Mal uh, Alaskan Malamutes, biggest of which is about 165 pounds. And you can see him here with my uh, sister-in-law. 
So what are we going to cover today? So we'll talk a little bit about what problems uh, OAuth solves. Uh, we'll look at how to get a token, what they look like, and, and how to care for them, both as a client and, and as a consumer. So to add some context to our discussion, I'm going to use our uh, sample application that, that takes to-dos, a to-do list, and puts it online. Users can do all the normal stuff, read, write, update, and delete their to-dos, but we don't want to let just anyone do this, right? Especially not for someone else's to-do list. So here's a sample architecture for our SaaS-based to-do list. Uh, I'd like to introduce a, a little terminology here that's important. So here we have the, the client, right? This is the mobile app, the web browser, or some other client. Here we have our OAuth server, right? This is commonly referred to as the authorization server. We have our resource server, right? This is our token consumer. The, 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 the data behind this is what we're trying to protect. And we also have the resource owner, who's typically the end user, right? The to-dos are the, the users, and we're just protecting the data for them. So what problem does OAuth solve? I like to use the term secure delegated access. And what does that mean? Let's dig into it. So here we have the client again. The client needs access to the to-do API, right? Here's our authorization server. Uh, credential and user management is happening here in, in the OAuth and user management platform. The to-do API has no knowledge of the user credentials. So is it instead, it's handed a token by the client from the OAuth server and provides access to the client based on the contents of that token. Right? We call this delegation because the client has been delegated access to protected resources behind the to-do API on behalf of the user. So how do we get a token? Right? There are a couple different types of grants in OAuth that determine how we get a token. The two you most likely encounter are the client credentials grant and the authorization code grant. The client credentials grant doesn't involve a user, and it's used for things like service-to-service -service authentication, and it's fairly straightforward, uh, implemented using a, a client ID and client secret. The grant we'll be talking mostly about today is the authorization code grant. The authorization code grant involves a user and is slightly more complex. So let's take a look at how this works and, and why it's secure. Here we have our architecture again. We see the OAuth and user management platform up top. We have the application backend, which is responsible for interacting with the OAuth server. And we have our to-do API. Everything to the right of the dotted line here is server-side, right? And with server-side, we have trust between server-side things, right? This is why the client credentials grant with client ID and secret work well here, right? We as developers have full control over how these credentials are set up, stored, and used. The, the client ID and secret are enough to identify and trust the machine or, or, or service with them. The client side on the left-hand side here is a little less trustworthy, right? We as developers don't have full control over what happens once the data gets to the client. We can't be 100% sure that data from the client hasn't been tampered with yet unless we take some actions. So here we're set up for an ideal use case for leveraging OAuth. Using OAuth, the app backend and the to-do API stay completely unaware of the credentials, right? Only the OAuth server deals with these. The, the APIs get tokens from the client that were issued by the OAuth server, right? One of the primary benefits of using OAuth is that we get this kind of natural security barrier built into the protocol. Now let's do a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the authorization code grant. All right, so the client makes an initial request to the OAuth server, right? And the OAuth server renders some HTML. This is probably something like your, your typical login page, right? And this is where the resource owner or the user, right, can enter the credentials, like the, their username and password, right? The OAuth server will validate these credentials, right? The benefit here is that you can offload this authentication. And once it's set up, you can do things like add uh, two-factor authentication and do other things, you know, maybe some advanced security checks like IP filtering and that sort of thing. And all of that can be done by the OAuth server. Assuming the user's authenticated successfully, 
the OAuth server will then redirect back to the client with the authorization code. Right, an authorization code is just a random string, right? They're single use, so there's some inherent security there with these codes. And this is not the same thing as a, a token. The client takes this authorization code and presents it to the application backend. Typically, as we have in this scenario, we have a client ID and secret that has been configured on the app backend ahead of time, right? And this secret uh, uniquely identifies the application backend with the OAuth server. This way, when the app backend makes a token request to the OAuth server and presents the client authorization code along with the client ID and secret, the OAuth server knows who it is, right? The backend is basically asking the OAuth server, is this, is this authorization code valid for my application? If it is, it will then return the requested tokens to the app backend, right? These tokens are likely the access token, which will grant access and a refresh token. The app backend then returns these tokens to the client so that the client can use these to access our protected resources. Now you might be thinking, hey, Mark, this seems a little bit dangerous, right? We're storing a bunch of access data on the client. How do we know one, no, no one will mess with it? Well, it's a great question. Uh, and we'll discuss like things like client-side storage of these tokens and validation in a bit. But for now, let, let, let's just go with it. Once the client has the tokens, the client can present the access token to the to-do API. And the to-do API will validate the token and allow the requested action to be taken if the token is valid. Again, we'll go over validation in a bit here. So in this case, let's just say the tokens are valid. And then the to-dos are return, returned to the client as JSON. All right, so just to recap here, we went from a user logging in to getting the requested data from our protected resource. And, and that's basically our, our SaaS-based to-do application example. Anyone have any questions on that? All right, I'm assuming one of two things have happened. I'm either done such a great job of explaining stuff, there are no questions, right? Or there's like maybe too much information here and you're still processing. So we'll definitely leave time for questions at the end if something pops up, because it's probably not the first case. Ooh. What was that? Oh, no, okay. All right, we'll, we'll move on here. All right, so uh, it's worth covering a little bit about who owns what in, in this integration. All right, so we'll cover some responsibilities next. Like here's our architecture again. OAuth and user management is done by the OAuth provider, right? This is something like Fusion Auth, right? But you know, I want you to be aware there are nu numerous open source libraries and other services available out there. I'm kind of partial to, to Fusion Auth for what probably seems like obvious reasons, but there's a lot of other reasons I like it as well, right? So recommend that you evaluate your needs and, and use what's right for, for your situation. The client and the API are owned by the application developer, right? These will require some custom business logic for this whole thing to work. So I mentioned tokens a few times. So let's take a look at what they are and how they're used. In OAuth, right, you have access tokens and refresh tokens. Then with OIDC, which is an add layer on top of OAuth, we have the concept of ID tokens, right? OIDC stands for Open ID Connect. It basically simplifies the way to verify the identity of users based on the authentication performed by the authorization server, right? And it's used to do things like obtain user profile information and, and other things of that nature. Right, the specification for access tokens calls for them to be opaque, right? This means they don't have any inherent structures, right? Whereas with uh, JSON web tokens or JOTS, we do have an inherent structure. In the wild, you'll often find that access tokens are actually JOTS. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about JOTS and go into some detail there. But the primary takeaway here is that access tokens are for the token consumer, right? In our example, the client presents the access token to the to-do API. Also wanna talk a little bit about refresh tokens, right? They're also opaque, right? Meaning there's no structure to them and they're used to grant uh, new access tokens. 
So refresh tokens are presented to the OAuth server, right? They're not meant for any other system. Um, so they can't really be used to grant access directly to the, the to-do APIs. As mentioned, ID tokens are part of the OIDC. They're not authorization. And ID tokens are presented to the client from the OAuth server, where the client can use the information in the token, right? This can be like user profile data that's used to update the state of the page or, or something of that nature. Access tokens fall into the category known as bear tokens, right? This is an important distinction. A good analogy for a bear token is a car key, right? When you use a car key, the car really doesn't care who has the key. It just cares that the, the, the key is there, right? Now, keep in mind that tokens are just data being passed around. You could have a, a bad actor that captured some of the, uh, the the access token and is now able to present the token to access protected resources. All right, so it's important that you have some checks in place, right? Just as, you know, as you wouldn't hand your your car keys to just anybody, uh, you need to ensure the the appropriate use of the uh, of the key. All right, I, this is my uh, first overseas presentation, and and this movie's a little bit older. I'm not sure if you've seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? essentially hands the keys to the Ferrari to a, a less than desirable valet and he takes it for a spin and, and, and that sort of stuff. So don't, don't want to be lost on the, on the culture there. All right, let's talk a little bit about protecting tokens. First, we'll talk about some client concerns, mm -hmm. right? The client, are, in our example, is the mobile app or web browser that's presenting the tokens to the do API, right? How should the client handle these tokens? As I talked about earlier, when you're using bearer tokens, we must be careful because these can be used by anyone, right? So over the wire, especially in production, we only want to use HTTPS, right? With development environments, like there's a little less of concern, but it's generally easy enough to set them up that I'd recommend doing it uh, using HTTPS uh, as well, uh, you know, just so that you're using the same thing in production and, and development. So one of the things we we'll want to do as well is keep the tokens out of the caches in between the, the, the service and the client. And, and we can do that by not putting the token in the URL. We also don't want to put the token in the query string. Right? So once the client has a token, storage is our next concern. And we have different concerns based on the client. All right? So for mobile, once you get the token back after the user's gone through the authorization code grant, you'll store the token on the device where no other application has access to it, right? This can be in encrypted storage or the keychain for iOS or similar for Android, right? And, and there are development libraries out there that help you take care of this. And basically, you need to know your, your platform and, and use uh, you know, what you need based on your needs. Web browsers have, have their own set of concerns, right? Cookies are a highly recommended option here. And, and you know, how does that work? So assuming the app backend has gone through the authorization code grant and receives the token, it can then send the tokens to the client as an HTTP only secure cookie, right? An HTTP only cookie is a tag that's added to the browser cookie that prevents client side scripts from accessing data. Right, it provides a gate that prevents the, the specialized cookie from being accessed by anything other than the server. Right, and this works well for, for every request to the to-do API. As long as the app backend and API are on the same domain and the cookie domain is set correctly, the cookies are sent automatically. Right, the API can then pull the tokens off the cookie headers. Right, Nothing else running on the client can access the cookies since we sent them uh, is HTTP only, and the cookies aren't, aren't sent unless we're using SSL. So this is a pretty secure way of doing it, right? This is a great option and scales well because you only have the, the client, you can have the client go directly to the API for as long as the access token is valid. So there's a couple other things we can do, right? Like you can also store the token in memory, or right? you can send the token down and, and store it in a variable. And that might work well for like something like a single page application, as long as you're not reloading the browser, right? If you're storing a variable and you reload the browser, you need to authenticate again. 
And there, there are a couple other options. Uh, something's being called a, a web worker, right? It's a way to the, to run scripts in the background threads. Like once a worker is created, a worker can send messages to the JavaScript code that created it, um, and and vice versa. And there's also something called the the back end for front end pattern. What this means is you actually have the app back end hold on to the tokens rather than send them down to the client. Right. Initially, I thought this sounded like a a, a great idea, but you also have to implement a few more moving parts, right? And that means developing and deploying them and maintaining them. Um, so I've never really used it. I've never used either of these methods, but but wanted you to be aware, aware of them. All right. Now let's take a, a look at uh, token lifetime recommendations. Sorry, we just got one question. Oh, oh yeah, there. sure. Um, uh, we just JP asking, um, is session storage, can you use session storage for storing tokens in the browser? Right. When, when, when I think about session, session, sorry, session storage, right? The on um, using that on the, the 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 server side, right, and then sending them down to the browser, and and I believe ses, session storage uses cookies as well, but but the cookies might not be marked appropriately, right? So. Unless I'm off, if somebody has a, a better idea, please, please clue me in. But I thought uh, session storage was essentially implemented with uh, client-side cookies as well. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think so. Yeah, I think we'll just have to have a look into session storage and exactly what, what is the mechanism there. But but as long as it's not, I guess, as long as it's not shared between applications or another application can't read it, it should be, should be all safe right, enough. Yeah. yeah, cool. Um, okay, we'll leave those, there's a few more, but we'll leave those questions to the end just to not break your flow too much. Sorry for interrupting that. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, 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 it's fine, right? Like it, it, this is a, a mm -hmm. informal gathering and you know, you're here to ask questions and learn. Okay, cool. Well, we've got another one um, over there. Is the HTTP cookie prevented from being accessed? How is the HTTP only cookie prevented from being accessed on the client side? Yeah, so my, guess... my oh sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, my my understanding is that that is a a browser based implementation, right? Okay. So you mark the cookies and such, and then the browser knows how to handle that. Okay, cool. And then um. Is the get method safe? I don't understand this question, Musa. Maybe you can give us a bit more context. Is the get method safe since it lacks data protection? Yeah. Um, what, what, what I would say there is that the, the, the get method itself is, is not, I wouldn't say is considered safe per se, right? And and using it over HTTP, anybody with a wire sniffer could pick it up, right? And that's why we we encourage the use of, of HTTPS, right? Because that, that, that provides that encryption and, and that level of security. Yeah. And uh, HTTPS does encrypt query string parameters, right? So yeah. if, even if a token is in the query string, it should be encrypted. It, it, it should be, but we generally want to keep it out of there because, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it can get involved with the cache and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then we got one more. How about using local storage for the token? Yeah, right. And so we, we kind of cover that a little bit, like with with the, the mobile apps and, and stuff. Um, you know, so if if you're using like secure storage on you know whatever uh, platform that, that you're using, and, and you know how to do that and make sure that nobody else other than your application could read it, you know, I I, I think you know that that that's kind of what we're talking about for the mobile apps. You know, I'm not I'm not sure you have that level of access, you know, using the browser to, to try to store stuff locally. Um, but yeah, if you can figure out a way, you know, the important thing is to ensure that that no, nothing other than your application can access it. Yeah, I think even yeah, with local storage in a browser, I think that is uh, uh, separated by by domain. So as long as it's nothing else on that domain can read it. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. So thank, thanks for the, the questions. We'll try to uh, jump back in here and then keep them coming, and we'll, we'll address them here a little more towards the end. Cool. All yeah, right. we'll, we'll stack them up. All right. So we're talking about uh, access tokens or uh, life, lifetimes for tokens, right? So access tokens are, are generally meant to be short, short-lived. Right, we're talking minutes or, or even se seconds for them, right? And going back to the concept of bear tokens, right? If an access token is stolen, right, it can be used by anyone who has it, so you don't want it valid for a long time. Mm -hmm. The problem here is every time the, the token expires, the user has to, to re-authenticate, right? We could increase the timeout for the access token, but that poses a security risk, right? So with short expiration time for access tokens, we don't want to force the user to log in every time they expire. So here is where the refresh tokens come into play, right? They're an integral part of, uh, of any OAuth-based system, right? They can be long-lived, right? They should still be protected, but can only be used to get new access tokens, right? They, they can't be used to access the protected resources directly, right? And so here's how they work in practice, right? Let's say the user has successfully signed in, right, and is using our application. And at some point, the client makes a, a request, right, maybe to update to do or assign to do some, someone else. And let's say we have the access token lifetime set for, for five minutes, right? At this, the request is made at the six minute mark. So this time the token, uh, access, the access token is expired. So the to do API denies the request. So what happens next? Right, the client should catch the request denied status and say, okay, my access token is no longer accepted, but I have this refresh token. Let's present the refresh token to the OAuth system. The OAuth system will run checks on the token, right? So what checks will run? Things like, you know, has the user logged out? Is the account still in good standing? You know, that, that, that sort of thing, right? If that all checks out, the OAuth system sends down a new access token. Right, the client can then present the new access token to the to-do API and continue to work as usual. Right, the client resubmits the request with the new token, and now the request is accepted. Right, the to-do API sends the back to to-dos as JSON. Right, and behind the scenes, the user like has transparently logged back in. Right, we recheck the authentication status on the user, and we've done this without requiring any action by the user. Right, so a couple of key takeaways for the refresh tokens, right? The client needs to know how to use it. The client needs to know how to store it. The client needs to know how to handle the, the denied requests. Right? And also needs to know how to present the refresh token to the OAuth server once the ask, access token has expired and can no longer be used, right? The client then needs to store the new access token and, and resubmit the request. So the, the to-do API, right, our to-do API doesn't have any action here. This is all client-side logic. All right, so we, we spent a little bit of time going over some, some client concerns here. Now let's look at uh, some, some of the consumer concerns, right? The consumer, remember, is the thing being presented, uh, the access tokens by the client, right? It's responsible for accepting those tokens and, val and, and validating. Once the tokens check out, the resource server will return the data, right? So remember from our example, right? The consumer is the to-do API. So there are really two options for validating tokens. Tokens with an internal structure can be examined, right? Or we can decide uh, to, to introspect the token, right? Introspect means to present the access token back to the OAuth server that generated the access token and then get back some additional information about that token. Examining the token like only works if we have something like a, a, a JOT, right? And remember, JOT is JSON Web Token, because these have uh, an internal structure, right? And it provides information about the token itself, right? When examining the JOT, we need to validate the signature, right? The JOT contains a signature, and validating the signature ensures the token has integrity and that no changes have been made since it's been issued, right? If changes have been made to the access token over the wire, like possibly by a bad actor, the signature will be invalid. Once we validate the signature, we need to validate the claims. So let, let me add a, a little context to this. We'll start off by looking at the job, 
right? Here, here we have the, the typical JSON web token, right? And we have three parts. The green is the token header. The blue is the token body or payload. And then we have the signature in white. The header and body are base64 URL encoded, right? So we can actually take a look at the header and body and, and decode it and see what it can, JSON it contains. Right, so if we look at the header, right, it, it contains some metadata. We have the, the algorithm here used for signing the token, right? In this example, uh, it's used HMAC with SHA-256, which is a symmetric key hashing algorithm, right, that uses one shared key. And, and we have the type of token, JOT in this case. All right, and here we have the, the body of the token that has some valuable information about our APIs. Right, things like uh, roles, the issuer, the audience, and, and and that sort of thing. And finally, in white, we have the signature. Right, the signature is an important part of any in, in any job. When creating the token, right, we take the header and body together and and run the cryptograph cryptographic algorithm over it. Right, this generates the signature so that when someone receives the token, they can verify that the, the signature is as expected. And therefore, no, the contents of the token can be trusted. So if the token is signed based on the original roles, right, and the roles were updated to something like uh, admin to, to super admin, right, the signature no longer match. And the consumer, right, would know that the token can't be trusted because the signature is invalid. Right, validating the signature. You always want to validate the signature, right? And, and how is this done? So in most larger systems, you'll see a, a public-private key cryptography used, right? So the OAuth system uh, that issues the token signs it with the private key, and the consumer, in this case our to-do API, needs to get access to a public key, which it uh, uses to determine that the job was signed correctly, right? There's a couple ways of handling this. So the public key can be deployed, uh, you know, to, to the to-do API, right? And this is convenient because we don't need any direct communication be between the OAuth server and the to-do API, uh, but this requires some, some configuration, right? You got to put the key on there ahead of time, right? A more common way of doing this is to reach out to the OAuth server's well-known endpoint to, to retrieve the keys, right? There's a a, a standard uh, J, JWKS, which documents how to publish public keys using the, that well-known endpoint for uh, the authorization server. All right, so remember the, the job header contains some information that will let you know how to validate the signature, right? So in this example header, right, the algorithm used to sign the token is RS-256, which is an asymmetric algorithm, right, that uses that public-private key pair. Right, the KID is the key ID, right? So you can use this to get the, the correct public key from the OAuth server so you can validate the signature. Right, if for any reason the signature is invalid, right, you want to stop immediately. Right, and, and typically the, the cryptographic signature validation is done with a library, right? The libraries exist for, for any language, right? And we strongly recommend like using a library. Like, don't try to do this yourself. Very complicated and, and very easy to make mistakes in, in the implementation. But if for whatever reason you, you find issues with the signature and, and, and it doesn't match up, like don't move forward, don't pass go, don't collect $200. Like the, the information you're getting is, is not good. So if the signature does check out and we can trust the, 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 the token, then everything checks out. Then we'll want to take a look at, at some of the token claims. <clears throat> All right, so here we have the payload from the job, right? And there are three primary important claims to validate, right? And keep in mind, it's the responsibility of the consumer, or to-do API in this case, to do the validation. If the validation fails, again, if, if any of the validation checks fail, we, we need to deny, deny access. So the first thing we're going to check is the issuer claim. Right, this can be like a, a domain, as you see here. Right, it could be a, also be a like a universally unique identifier, a random string, or your full URL. It really doesn't matter what it is, as long as it is ex what is ex what is ex expected by your to do API. This tells us who generated the token. 
so we know how to who, how to trust it. All right, the next thing we need to validate is the expiration time, right? So the expiration expiration time is basically the number of seconds since January first, nineteen seventy, and if it's in the future, then the token is valid. If it's in the past, then the token is expired, and we can deny access to the users. All right? Again. There's a lot of libraries out there that help us determine the status, so you don't necessarily have to put your, your math skills to the test. The last standard claim we're going to check is the audience claim, right? This represents who the token is intended for, right? Again, this can be any value as long as the OAuth system and the to-do API agree on the valid values. Now, you might be thinking, you know, why, why does this matter? So... Imagine that you have uh, another API, right, where access is managed by the OAuth server, right, say a, a billing application. If we don't check the audience and the attacker has captured a, to to a token for the to-do API and that user has an admin role there, right, in theory, they could present the same token to the billing API and the signature would check out and everything and, they, and they'd get admin access to the billing data. So we need to make sure that the token is, is meant for the right audience, right? So we definitely want to check that out when validating the claims. Once those three main uh, claims have been validated, you can go into checking the, the, the roles and, and scopes or, or any other information you have in the job. But issuer, expiration, and audience should always be checked. All right, and the other option I talked about before is to use the, the introspect capabilities, right? And and th this works by, again, sending the, the request back to, or sending the token back to the OAuth server, right? Mm -hmm. So when the to-do API receives a token, right, it'll directly call the OAuth system's introspect endpoint, saying, hey, I have this access token, can you tell me about it? Right, and this is what we can expect in return from, from that endpoint, right? Very similar to the payload of a, a JSON log token, right? And we can see we have the additional claim of, of active sets of true, letting us know that this token is still good. Did I hear someone speak up? All right. Um, good. All right, I think I'm pre pretty close to the end here. I see a couple more questions coming in, so... I'll go over the last little 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 bit here and then get to some questions. How are we doing on time? Doing all right. Okay. Yeah, we're good all on time. So. All right. So it's a, a good idea to, to briefly touch on some JSON web token issues, right? Since the they're so commonly used as access tokens. All right. One thing is generally don't try to to roll your own. We want to use existing libraries, right? But there's a lot of libraries out there. So make sure you do your research and, and watch out for bad implementations, okay? Another important thing to recognize when we're working with JOTS, the, the specification allows for a none algorithm when, when signing the token, right? This means that there's like no signature validation. That means anybody can put anything they want in there and you have no way of validating that that's, that's true or not. Uh, so, so stay away from, from JOTS with using the none algorithm. All right, so in conclusion, right, we recommend using tokens, right? On the client side, be sure to transmit tokens securely, handle token storage appropriately, and handle the refresh tokens. On the consumer side, be sure to, to validate the tokens, examine the signature, or use introspection, and check out the claims. Now, like what we've gone over can seem like a, a bit much, Right, but as mentioned before, like there's several libraries out there for most languages, right? And and this turns what looks like a lot of steps and work into basically a, a simple uh, inclusion of, of a library and configuration, and then you're off and running, right? Um, so that all of this is a bit of a look at what happens like under the covers when 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 using the library. So with that. Right, like to thank you all for your time. Let's see, we've got some additional questions we'll we'll go over here. But I want to make sure that like uh again, if, if you have questions afterwards or or you, you take a look at some of our samples and you have questions, like don't hesitate to to shoot me an email or join our, our fusion auth forum, right? Or, or reach out to me on social. 
uh, you know, my job here is to help make sure that you can get uh, your, your authentication needs working as desired, right? And if you're interested in applying some of this knowledge, you can download Fusion, R, Fusion Off and, and start playing with it. Um, just so you're, you're aware, our uh, self-hosted community version is, is free. So you can download that, run that, run production on it if you want. And then uh, as you grow, right, you can, uh, we, we offer web hosting services and a few more advanced uh, security features like MFA and that sort of thing, uh, multi-factor authentication with uh, upgraded licenses. Um, but definitely check out our website there. We've got a bunch of uh, quick starts that help you get up and running in, in many languages. Bradley and I were talking about them a little bit uh, bef before the meeting. Um, and then if you go to your web, our website, we also uh, have an ebook called the, the Modern Guide to, to OAuth, uh, if you're interested. And so feel free to grab it and do a little further reading. Awesome. So, Thanks so much, Mark. That was that was cool. And uh, yeah, I think it, everyone's dealing with with auth these days and especially with, um, you know, APIs and cloud services and all sorts of things and third party auth. So it's, I think it's a, a really interesting thing to get yeah. get to know and, there's so many new options now yeah and and you know i, I mean I'm, I'm sure you're all much, much, much brighter than i am but uh you know it, it can be a, a, a at least for me it was a bit in, intimidating at first right like yeah you're dealing with security and and there's lots of uh, standards and, and that sort of thing and like i said the one thing i want to stress about this talk is that there's you know a lot of moving parts for sure but for for you know most major uh, languages, you know they have libraries set up and just put in the name of your your OAuth server, your client, your secret, and like it handles uh, because of the standard, it handles like the uh, it can handle like the introspection and and the the re refresh tokens and you know a lot a lot of other things. Cool. Um, we've got another question from Craig, who's just asking. Um... Would you recommend preemptively refreshing the access token before expiry, or would you would you only do so when you when the access is denied? So I'm guessing if you get a 401 back from your API. I I give you my least favorite but most common answer, right? Like it depends, <laughs> right? It, it it depends on on what you're you're doing and how your users interact, right? If if there's if you have a very quick timeout and and your users take a, a long time between actions and the the token is going to expire pretty often, then yeah, you can save a lot of round trips right by by doing it preemptively, um, you know. But I, I think the most common use case, uh, you know, is if, if you have uh, you know a lot of user interaction, a short amount of time, is to catch the the, the timeout. And and then you know handle it then. Okay, cool. Um, see any more questions there? I've got one or two. Um, I'll get it in while other people are are brewing up some questions. Um, oh, we've got quite a few. But um, can you you're talking about audiences in the in the token claim? Can you have multiple audiences in a in a token? Can a token be aimed at multiple different services or should it just be you know one audience per token? I, I can't answer that definitively. I believe it is one audience per token. I'll have to look into that. You know, but but that doesn't mean you can't have multiple applications expecting the same audience. Does, does, okay. does that make sense? So yeah. like if roles are the same for your to-do API and your billing API, in theory, you just say, hey, my audience is my API, right? And then both applications will expect that, that audience. Okay, cool. Okay, we've got one from Baja. Um, in terms of the web, provided all the the necessary precautions you mentioned are taken to protect the tokens. Would there still be any scenario that could lead to it being compromised by bad actors or is it 100% fail safe? Is, is anything 100% fail safe? Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. The, these are best practices and, and like industry, you know, accepted standards. Right. But, 
there are, you know, you look look at what's happening with like the 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 casinos in, in in Las Vegas right now, right? Like there there is a human element to certain things, and if somebody has the right access to the right network, you know, they they could possibly you know decrypt some of the the uh, you know, some of the encryption and, and that sort of thing. So, like I said, you know, I'd say, again, like these are industry standard techniques. And so I feel comfortable using them, but is anything 100%? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, no, it's difficult. It's, it, I mean, there's always just like more safe or, or less safe, but I don't think there's anything in the world that's, that, one hundred percent safe of anything. Yeah. Um, and then Henny's got a question: Do you need to use AD to authenticate users for token generation, or can you use a simplified list of users like emails or usernames? Yeah, I think that one. That one just depends on your provider. I mean, you can certainly use AD, right? You can even most providers will allow you to use third party. Um, uh, yeah. what is it called like like uh, third party yeah. Yeah. So one of the, the the things I like about Fusion Auth, and again, you know, other services will do similar things, is that once I have uh, my uh, authorization server set up in Fusion Auth, you can go and configure like your your Google authentication, right? You set up an app ID and that sort of stuff, and tie that to your uh, login instance, and then you can add Apple or Facebook. And all of that is configurable in the admin UI in FusionAuth. So your application, right, still gets back your, your job, right? So it's kind of indifferent to the application. That all hand that is all handled on the uh, authorization server uh, platform. Yeah. And you know, and one, like I said, one of the great things about this is like, hey, I don't have to figure out Google Google's code and then implement that, and I don't have to figure out Apple's code and implement that. Like the uh, Fusion Auth kind of handles that behind the scenes. You just have to get your your account set up appropriately and put in the right information in the admin UI, and you get all that stuff okay. essentially for free. Cool. Um, I think Josh, you got a question? Uh, I... Yeah, no, I just wanted to highlight. Um, I think it's Peter Swanepoel. Uh, well, his name's other way around. It's Swanepoel Peter, but I'm assuming it's Peter Swanepoel. Um, asked um, if there's any libraries you propose or, or always go to. He did ask that under the thread for get methods being safe, but I'm not sure if that was perhaps by accident. Yeah. Peter, have you got anything more for that question? Yeah, it was just by accident. I wanted to know if there's any libraries he proposes that he that's his go to. Okay. Uh, it, it really depends on on which language you use. Uh, I don't have the link off the top of my head, but I will get it for you. Somewhere on our website, we have a list of, of client libraries that are for commonly used languages. Yeah. So I'll, I think I'll, a lot I'll, of I'll yeah, a, a lot of languages also have it a, a built into their standard frameworks now. Um, certainly yeah. the enterprise ones. I know .NET is built in. Um, well, you can download a NuGet package from Microsoft and there's uh, one for, for Java Spring. Um, I've used both of those. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure. For things like Python and that, I think, and, and JavaScript or Node, there'll probably be good third-party ones, standard ones, yeah. Although Express, I think, can do it for Node. So, yeah, I think the major frameworks, major web frameworks have got it built in as far as I've seen. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if I... I'll, I'll, I'll get that link to you, Bradley, and then you get it out to the, the rest of the team. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll post that. Okay, cool. Craig's got another question. Um, in terms of revoking issued access tokens... Is there any standardized mechanism other than making the access token expire uh, quicker? Not, not really. There's, I, I've seen some implementations in that, uh, not necessarily per per user, but overall, where there's some some uh, logic essentially said, hey. 
any access token before this date is is invalid and you could put that date out in the future right so like you know if your access token time is, is five minutes long that you can say hey any any access token that is valid less than you know five minutes into the future is, is invalid right I, I don't know if I, I said that clearly or that makes sense right so you can implement some custom logic that says not just is the token valid past this instant but past whatever instant it would be when all your tokens expire yeah uh, i guess it's it's difficult to do um if you're validating that token you know on that api itself because you're not even talking to your auth provider at that point you're just verifying the signature on that on that token and that's cool because you don't have to make a call every time you get a call um, every time you get an incoming request, you don't have to make an outgoing request to your auth provider. But then, yeah, you go. It's going to you're going to not be able to revoke a token unless you've got some custom logic to say, okay, he has a list of revoked tokens, or like like you say, Mark, um, just say like any token for this person shouldn't be, you know, uh, unless it's um, newer than than whatever date it sh it should be revoked. Yeah. So I guess that's the case for making the 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 token um, validity fairly short and using and, and relying more on refresh tokens, correct? Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, have we got anything else? Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. So if you've got anything else, put up your hand or I think we had someone else put up their hand earlier. I'm not sure if your question was answered. Um, let me look through the list and see who. Yeah, it's just making a question. Ah, cool. How's it going? Yes, yes. Good, good. Now, I just wanted to find out um, regarding um, um, client IDs and client secrets when you authenticate using like any auth provider, like mm -hmm. um, what's the recommended way to to manage those secrets on the back end after authenticating the user before you generate the tokens? Yeah, so right, the, the, those can be handled again you know several ways depending on on your implementation right like a, a common thing we do for a lot of our, our quick starts is you know set up environment of their environmental variables on on the server and and store the uh the client id secret in, in the environmental variables but it would be you know any any other secure way of, of storing them on the server will work as well yeah. Yeah. There's there's also um if you're using a cloud provider, they've they a lot of them now have like secure um secret storage, which you can use to set set it up, or you can use third party oh. things like um I think like HashiCorp Vault is one of them that you can put secrets in and then access it securely from your from your running services. And then I know that .NET has also got some fancy stuff that you can um you can store. In, in the runtime, it's got a mechanism that you can store secrets um, that are that are encrypted, and 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 you can read it there. But generally, I guess the idea is just don't put it in your Git repo. Is the big no no. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that would be the bare minimum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because then, then you know, pretty much the whole world will get hold of it at some point, or at least Chat GPT will get hold of it. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. And okay. you know that, nice. that, 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 that's uh you know I mean you're you're, you're joking around a little bit too but uh, one one of the the nice things to do and, and think about is like secret rotation right like uh you know Fusion Off has APIs right so you can run program you know automated programs that, that change the client ID in secret so often and then store them somewhere or something like that so you know that they're not you don't have one long living one out there for a long time yeah that's actually it, it... That's actually a good point. How often would you recommend changing that that client secret? Again, it 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 depends, right? Like if 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 I was creating an application, you know, I I'd probably do it at least once a month, right? But it all depends on how active your application is and you know you, you don't want to cut somebody off halfway through because things have changed and, and and that sort of stuff yeah 
Okay, cool. That's a good rule of thumb. Uh, oh, I see people have started dropping off. So just before everyone drops off, uh, do, do, would you mind picking um, three winners from the questions that were asked? Oh, I think at the beginning, Bradley said that they were the the first questions, right? So let's uh, yeah. take, take a look here, right? So I think... Technically, it looks like J JP Russell, right? Is storage session a no no when storing tokens? Kind of talked about that. And then I'm terrible with names, so forgive me, but I think it's, it's got to be Mar. Sheldon Hayes. Oh, yeah, it's South African yeah. names all over the map. We got them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. So, yeah, JP. Yeah, Mar. And then Jock. And. Jocks, yeah. So they'll probably that sounds like a... Yeah, that sounds good. So, cool. So Joshua, are you going to be able to get your uh their information? I'll attempt to do so, yes. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks, thanks there, Mark. Um okay, great. Yeah, I think we, we we're pretty much at the at the end of the, the presentation um there of, of our time. And um thanks thanks once again, Mark, for for joining and showing us all these, you know, something that's that we all have to deal with nowadays and in sure. some ways make auth, you know, a bit more of a learning curve. And it might be just because no one did auth really securely before. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe so maybe auth is a good thing that there's now a standard way to do these things and also allows you to interconnect and, and have distributed APIs and all these great things that would have been a, quite a, you know, like custom um, solutions before. Everything evolves and we have to evolve with it, right? Right, that's it. Um, and thanks uh, for everyone for joining. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Just before we move on, it seems Jacques has dropped off. Um, okay. So I don't know if we want to pick the next one in line. Okay, cool. Let's have a look. Uh, Jacques, if you do hear us and you under another name, speak very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, let's have a look. And I think the next one was from Craig, Craig Nicholson. Cool. Um, cool. Make sure to get those out. Oh, Craig says skip me. Okay, so let's skip Craig. Uh, maybe Craig's already got too many licenses. <laughs> uh, uh, let's have a look. Craig, then the next one I think is Musa, Musa Beloy. Cool, we've got three names now. Musa, uh, is, is Musa still there? Seeing him in the list. Well, well, while we're waiting for him, I just want to say, you know, thank you for having me. Thanks for for showing up. You know, I think these meetups are are, are great. And uh, like I was telling Bradley earlier, one of the things I love presenting is, you know, I I, I get to learn as well. And so, uh, really appreciate what you all do here. And uh, thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah, and I think we had a pretty healthy turnout um, for the the virtual event this evening, and yeah. it just kind of shows that it's a hot topic and everyone's everyone's keen on it. So. Yeah, maybe we'll have to revisit some other aspect of it um, at a future date. So thanks very much for joining, Mark. And thanks for everyone else um, that attended. Uh, I know it's a, it's, it's it's sometimes an awkward time of, of the evening, but thank you so much for attending. And um, we hope to see you next time and uh, even in person in, in the future. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Oh, thanks, Aran. Cheers. Bye. Oh, cheers. Cool. Um, do I need to do anything with the name?